Hello, welcome to my March 2021 wrap up video starring most ostentatious hat. Um, so yeah, what books did I read in March 2021? Well, I, um, I read 12 and they are a bit of a mix. There's a lot of comics, there's a lot of audio books. Um, because I was trying to read all of the digital books that I currently had out um, over on loan or from NetGalley with an expiration date. Basically everything with an expiration date. Um, so um, the reason I was doing this is because of, um, if you will have seen my uh, Julianne vs TBR update in my previous wrap up, you'll know that I decided to put myself on a um, digital book ban um, uh, till the end of April. Lots of people when I say digital book ban are assuming I mean buying ban. No, 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 no. Let me tell you, I am still buying digital books. It's a reading ban. I can only read physical books other than those ones which were due to expire. And I, it was actually really successful March in getting me to clear that out. Um, so although I only read digital books in March, I have only got one comic left that I need to read, um, one graphic novel rather, um, that I need to read and then I am done with all the digital books and can devote myself fully to this stuff. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, I just made myself read the books that I had out, even when I didn't necessarily want to, um, and yeah, I read some good stuff and I enjoyed it and I'm almost free, I'm almost free of the digital deadlines and then I can I can try and read some of this stuff specifically this stuff because I want to start with this cube here um, it's got an enormous part of Georgette Heyer books a lot of historical fiction um, <laughs> but who knows that's the idea I'm gonna start with that cube uh, but I may end up just following my heart and reading whatever I feel like I don't mind as long as it gets some books read right um, and I'm already thinking I probably will have to extend the digital book ban until May. Um, but anyway, anyway, what did I read in March? Well, the first book I finished listening to in March was The Tyranny of Lost Things by Rhiannon and Lucy Coslett. Um, I borrowed this through um, a really random app. Um, so one of the libraries I'm a member of has like three different audiobook apps. It's very strange. Um, but uh, one of them only had, like I went through the entire catalogue a while ago and it only found like a couple of books that I wanted to read that were on that catalogue. And one of them was The Way Past Winter, which I read, um, I think I finished in February and I mentioned in my last wrap up. And then the other one was The Tyranny of Lost Things. So I had not heard of this book before. But I was really intrigued by the synopsis. So essentially it's about a, um, a woman who is, she's currently a student, she's in her second year of university I think and she's like just dropped out um and she's like kind of pretending to still be a student and she moves in with um she moves into a flat in a house so basically she used to live in when she was a child so her parents were kind of hippies and they were into communal living and they lived in this big house in London with a bunch of other people who shared their beliefs um and she has this, this kind of like attachment to the place um, and she's not sure why. Um, and so she sets out to sort of figure out what it is, um, but in a really roundabout way. She kind of, she do it, she moves into the house and she sort of like, doesn't really know what to do yet next. But then the woman down, who lives downstairs recognizes her. Um, and so she starts talking to her and she kind of like, whilst kind of living her life and making lots of like early twenties messed up mistakes, um, she figures out, um, you know, she kind of pulls at the threads of the story and she ends up finding out what's going what's going on. Um, I thought this book was really good. I would especially recommend it if you liked, um, if you like Jessie Burton's books. It really reminded me of The Confession, um, which is her latest book. Um, so if you enjoyed that, I would definitely check this out. The next book that I finished reading in March was Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. Um, I looked up on YouTube how to pronounce that name and I tried several times. Um, I am not familiar with Polish at all so I apologise, I have made my very best effort there. <laughs> um, but I thought this was brilliant. I was not expecting to like this. Um, it was a pick for my book club at work 
I didn't choose it and um, I was really nervous going in because I was so not in the mood for literary fiction. I was just not in the mood at all. Not at all. Not at all. Um, so I started this the day before book club. Um, to my relief, um, I think it's I think it's just like 300 pages or less than 300 pages, um, and I loved it. I got into it right away. It's just brilliant, and I really want to read more more books by this author. Um, so it's a really strange kind of like um, I guess it's like a unreliable narrator murder mystery. So the narrator is um, she's a woman who kind of lives in this like kind of remote foresty village place where lots of people don't live full time like a lot of people have holiday homes there and they actually live in the city um and so she's like kind of like the guardian of a lot of these places like she goes around and makes sure that all the houses are okay when their um, owners are not there and she gets paid a little bit of money for this um but otherwise you know she doesn't like she doesn't seem to see that many people at the start of the book it's just her and her neighbors um who are all quite kind of distant and at the start of the book she um and another neighbor um go into like sort out the dead body <laughs> of um, their other neighbour. Um, so I think he finds it and he like calls her over to come and like look at it. Um, and they end up like kind of like dressing him up before the police get there um, to make him look a bit more presentable and stuff. Um, and yeah, it's just, I don't want to give that many more details away because I went into this book knowing nothing about it and I, I loved it so <laughs> I, I I don't want to like say any more than that but it's it's really fun um, and it's really interesting as well and um, the author sounds like a really interesting person and so I definitely want to read more of her books. The next book that I finished reading in March was The Story of My Tits by Jennifer Hayden. This is a um, graphic novel written by a woman who had uh, breast cancer in her 40s. Um, and I went into it for thinking it would be quite focused around this, but actually it's about her entire life story and that's why it quite, kind of lost me, because it's very long and it sort of details her, basically her entire life up until the point at which she decided to write the comic and although it, it was fine, I just found it very like confusing to follow because I was like, well, okay, when does this get back to, um, like, the actual, like, what I thought was the point of it going in, like the, the breast cancer bit, I was very, I was very confused. When it does actually get to the breast cancer bit, that bit isn't very long as well. Um, and I guess it was kind of trying to make a point that the story of my tits is the story of my life. Um, but yeah, I don't know, something about it just didn't 100% work for me, even though, um, yeah, I don't know, I just kind of feel like I was misled a bit about what the story was going to be about um, and so maybe I went into it with the wrong attitude and um, kind of preconceived ideas that led me to not enjoy it so much but it was very very long um, I don't know I feel like yeah I don't know I don't know like I can't really pinpoint anything that was wrong with it I just feel like it wasn't for me um, <laughs> which is kind of hard to it's hard to explain so I'm not gonna bother trying anymore um, the next book I finished reading I thought was lovely um, and that is um, Four Sisters Enid. Um, this is a graphic, another graphic novel and this is one of four um, and they were originally published in French and I like trying to track down the others in the series I cannot find where I can buy the second one of the series. Um, so I bought the first one from the library but they only have the first one typically with most of these graphic novels that I get from the library if it's a series they only ever have the first one. Um, so yeah, uh, I really liked it. It's a really sweet story about five girls who um, kind of live in this decrepit old mansion with their ghost parents, um, sort of like officially under the care of their aunt, but she like hardly pays any attention to them at all. And so they're just kind of surviving on their own um, and having like little adventures. And it's just really, really beautifully brought, drawn and the location is fabulous. And all the sisters have different personalities. I know it says four sisters. Um, and there's five of them, but I think it's because each one has four sisters. Um, so yeah, I I really liked this and I want to read the next one and I, I don't know where it is. I don't know how I can get hold of it. And that's, yeah, that's really annoying. Um, I don't know if they even translated the third and the fourth one 
into English, now I'm gonna have to learn French, <laughs> like properly, to read the rest. No fair, no fair at all. I think it probably will be easier to track down the second one in French though, so maybe I should just, maybe I should just do that and translate it myself, I might learn something. <laughs> um, the next book I finished reading was another graphic novel, and that is, um, well, it's a, it's not really a graphic novel, it's like a, a compendium of a webcomic, and that was um, Strong Female Protagonist, book one, um, which is by Brennan Lee Mulligan and Molly Ostertag. Um, I loved this. I had not, I, I think I felt like I'd vaguely heard of the webcomic, um, and yeah, that's, that's all I can really say about my preconceptions going in. Um, and it's about a, it's about like a, a woman who's an ex superhero who's now just trying to go to university and get on with her life. But you can't ever really be an ex superhero, especially when you're literally the strongest person on earth. Um, <laughs> and like completely indestructible. Um, which she is. And she's just like, yeah, there's kind of this like conspiracy like going on and it's got lots of like ethical questions about the existence of superheroes. I would describe it as like a non-nihilistic version of The Boys. So if you found The Boys like interesting in one respect for what it has to say about individualism and um, the problems with the superhero genre, but on the other hand you really hated how like grim and disgusting it is and bleak and miserable, like honestly like I really struggled watching that series because it was just so negative. Um, yeah, if, if you also struggled watching that series because it was so, so bleak, give Strong Female Protagonist a go because it is, covers a, like a lot of the same ideas but in a much less depressing, dragging you down <laughs> storyline. Um, so yeah, even though there's some, there's some dark stuff in this, I can't lie, there is some dark stuff, um, but it's like the overall tone of the story and doesn't drag you down in the way that I found The Boys does. So yeah, yeah, that's based off The Boys TV show, by the way. I have not read the comics and I don't want to. So at this point in the filming process, um, I said next book and my Amazon Echo interpreted that as its name and chimed in. And I didn't notice until afterwards. Um, this actually happened in another video. I don't know what's wrong with my enunciation of the words next book but hey but hey um anyway 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 so here i am a few days later filming this part of the video um so the next book i finished reading in march 2021 was how to be autistic by charlotte media poe um this is a short memoir about the author's experience growing up um, as an undiagnosed autistic person um, and how they struggled at school um, because they had um, no real diagnosis, they were being medicated and treated for other things, um, their um, mother didn't really know how to handle it, uh, how to advocate for them properly, um, they had a teacher who um, was really really awful to them um, and I read this because I've been getting more interested in autism um, because I follow Hux on Twitter um, who um, tweets a lot about characteristics of autism that you may not know are characteristics of autism um, at Little Hux um, and um, I relate to a lot in fact I have an ongoing list now <laughs> that I keep adding to every time they mention something new or I otherwise read about something new elsewhere um, and yeah it, it's getting quite long it's getting quite long so I thought I'd better read more about autism and in particular um, books written by people who were um, brought up as girls socialized as girls because um, it's often not diagnosed um, in girls because um, people kind of know the stereotypical ways in which it presents in boys but not how it presents in girls and how that might be different for various reasons um and yeah I definitely related to this a lot a lot especially the author's experience at school with that one problematic teacher problematic teacher problem teacher really awful teacher um I had an experience with an awful teacher myself um Thankfully, I only had that awful teacher in year four. 
I did not have that awful teacher in my life for several years in secondary school like the author of this book did and yeah reading this book I had this incredible feeling of there but for the grace of God go I basically um not a religious person but that phrase seemed the most appropriate because this could have been me basically if I had had a teacher who provoked me as much as that teacher did consistently um throughout secondary school I just I don't know how I would have got through it I am amazed that the author of this book did as well as they did essentially and you know they didn't really do that well at all because it was so difficult for them and they've struggled so much and they're in their 30s now and it's taken them such a long time to get a proper diagnosis to get proper support and yeah it was just really really eye-opening and close to my own experiences in a really quite thought-provoking way um but at the same time I really enjoyed it and at the same time there is this really hopeful note to it because although um, the author struggled so much and has had such a horrible time um, throughout their teens and it had a knock-on effect for their whole twenties um, in the end they discovered this form of self-expression they entered a competition um, an art competition with a video and they won this competition and that changed their whole life and they got this book deal out of it and I really look forward to seeing how they you know how they continue to express themselves and what they do next um, and yeah so yeah hard going but ultimately hopeful I think that's that's my review of this book I'm hoping in the next few months that I can follow it up by reading STEM, an autistic anthology, um, which was edited by Hux, Lizzie Huxley Jones there. So I can read more people's experiences of autism and generally learn more about it and probably add to my list. <laughs> Cause that's, 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 um, yeah. That seems to be what Hux does. Make me add to my list all the time. And I'm not the only one. There are loads of people. <laughs> The next book that I finished reading um, in March, totally different, um, totally did not like it. <laughs> um, and that was To Sir Philip With Love by Julia Quinn, which is the fifth, yes, the fifth Bridgerton book and the last one that I think I will be reading because I did not like this at all. I disliked it so much I went on Goodreads, found someone who like in their review had written basically my exact same opinion and then went onto their profile, found their romance shelf, scrolled through their romance shelf until I found the previous Bridgerton books um, that I'd read to check that they had the same opinion of them as I did and then I saw what they thought of the later ones and they did not like the later ones so I am not reading the later ones. I mean I'm actually quite happy because that's some little more books off my off my plate. I was kind of reading this as like romance history anyway like I had not heard like that they held up particularly well um to contemporary readers that there are definitely some problematic things um however I'd also heard that they get better later on I don't think they get better later on. <laughs> in my February wrap up I talked about um romancing Mr Bridgerton the fourth one in the series which is about Penelope and Colin um and how like it disappointed me um and this one I kind of like I wasn't prepared to love it because it's about a um a widowed father um he's the he's the like love interest and that is not a scenario that I get particularly excited about um and um Eloise who I felt like lots of people have a really strong attachment to Eloise but I barely got a sense of her in the previous books so like I don't know why um is it just off of the tv show because I'm sure I've seen people pre-tv show talking about how much they love Eloise um but anyway um this just not <laughs> just did not work for me at all um so basically the plot line is that Eloise Bridgerton um writes to her cousin's widow to say I'm sorry for your loss and he writes back and sends her a flower and then they get like they send more and more letters and he's like oh I need a new wife to look after my kids because my kids are a nightmare a new wife will sort everything out um and so she he he writes to her and he's like well I'm looking for a wife, you might want to marry me, 
come visit for a bit and we'll see if we get on. So she's like, sure, I will totes do this. I'm going to run away. <laughs> Because I live in Regency England and that's going to work out well. Um, yeah, so she like, runs away um, and like goes and stays with him for a couple of days and then like her family catch up and make them get married. And I'm just like... I can't deal with this like forced marriage trope. Every book in this series so far, bar the one I like, <laughs> the one I genuinely 100% like, rather than just like a bit, um, involves this trope and I'm just like okay I get it there was this whole like morality and like getting married to avoid women being ruined and things but it's not romantic and I feel like an author should get to use this trope like twice in the writing career it, and, and like think of other things to do for the rest of it because it happens in all of these books except one <laughs> and I just can't <sighs> So yeah, the inevitable happens and they have to learn to get along. And I guess I guess the author is interested in how they learn to get along after they've already got married, but I get bored once they've got married, right? Um, especially if yet again nobody gets to have a big fancy wedding. Like I'm reading a Regency romance. I want to read about a big fancy wedding with lots of gorgeous gowns. Please give me that. If someone knows if someone could recommend a Regency romance in which there is a big wedding with lots of with lots of gorgeous gowns let me know because I want to read that please um anyway I'm like what is the point about reading all of these upper class people if they're not going to have big fancy weddings with lots of, lots of gorgeous gowns like really like really I may as well read a much more interesting romance about people in lower classes um, and there are plenty of those there are plenty of like middle class Regency romances out there um and I could happily read one of those instead of instead of this, where are oh my gorgeous gowns and big fancy weddings. Anyway, anyway, I didn't like it. I won't be continuing. That is the end for me in the Bridgerton series, I strongly suspect. Next up, also on the romantic front, I read The Secret Loves of Geeks, which is a anthology um, of uh, different things, like uh, prose and also um, like short comics and yeah. Um, it's a sequel to a book called The Secret Loves of Geek Girls, which I haven't read. Um, and oddly, this is the second one in the series, and that's the one they had at the library. Um, I really want to read the first one, though, because I really enjoyed this. Um, it's an anthology, right? So there's is a mixed bag. There's some stuff that's that's really relatable. There's some stuff that's not so relatable. There's some stuff I think was really good. There's some stuff, some stuff, blah. There's some stuff that I think wasn't so good total mixture but overall I really really enjoyed it um so they're all stories about um secret loves in some ways um like things they love people they've loved uh what ifs never was <laughs> all of that kind of stuff um it's a real real mixture and I really enjoyed it nothing really more to say other than that um, the next thing I finished reading was not a library book this time, it was um, a Net Kelly book and that is The L Lucky Escape by Laura Jane Williams. God, does Goodreads tell me when this is coming out? Uh, June, June, yes. Um, so I got, I, I, was, I was lucky to get a um, copy of Net Kelly because I had uh, previously reviewed via Net Kelly Laura Jane Williams' two other books, Our Stop and The Love Square and I was really intrigued by this so this is about a woman who is um, jilted on her wedding day and then ends up going on her honeymoon with another man um, and it's um, actually in first person uh, I don't think Laura has done a book in first person before so that was quite interesting um, and I think it worked really well um, because you kind of need to be inside uh, the protagonist's head in this situation for it to be as strong and compelling as it was um, and it was just, just like a really great bit of escapism really um, it's the lucky escape for her and it's the lucky escape for us because we get to go on this little journey um, to Australia on her honeymoon <laughs> in our heads and they go to all these cool places have a luxurious time um, and then what's really interesting is that's not where the book ends they come back to the UK and she has to figure out her new life solo um, and how um, this guy that she's gone on holiday with kind of fits into her new life and whether it's going to work out if it's not going to work out and that was really really interesting and I really enjoyed it and would recommend it the next book that I finished reading was, we're back on the graphic novels now, we've got three graphic novels before the end, 
Um, so the first one I finished reading uh, was called The Once and Future Queen. This is a King Arthur retelling except for um, there's like some like mystical time travel thing, there's a, like a war against fairies and King Arthur's a woman, um, like a teenage girl. And um, I was like really excited by this idea and I did not like the execution. Um, it didn't last more than another, another collected edition. Um, and I can see why. It's like they tried really, really hard, uh, right? They like tried to make it diverse and like have like a poly relationship and um, like have a woman protagonist. But it just, it was just really flat for me. Um, so, like, the main problem I had with it is that, uh, like, the three main characters who are, like, uh, Arthur, Guinevere and Lancelot, um, of the story, um, are just, like, magically compelled to know what they're doing and be able to fight and fulfil their destiny and to not resist it at all. And that removes all tension from the story, right? Because when you're in, when you're reading a book about, um, teenage characters who suddenly have a destiny thrust upon them, usually they have a lot more questions and a lot more reluctance because you you would, wouldn't you? Um, and they just kind of go along with it and it means that there's not that much like dramatic tension. There's just like a lot of fighting and like it looks very cool. <laughs> uh, but there wasn't like, I kind of wanted something deeper and so I don't know, I don't know. I felt like it was just like pitched kind of a bit oddly and it was not for me and I won't be tracking down the second volume. Um, the next graphic novel I really really loved and this was super cute, this is a middle grade graphic novel called The Secret of Danger Point. It's in the Surfside Girls series and it's set in I think a, a small town in California? Um, I looked at this up afterwards because I wasn't sure. I wasn't even sure if it was set in the US or what um, until I until it got to like a bit where there was like some reference to it. Um, yeah, like there was an East Coast, West Coast reference. I was like, oh, it must be the US then because that's like the only co context I've seen that reference in. Um, so yeah, it's basically about two best friends, um, girls in their early teens, I think, who um, get involved in a mystery. Um, so they're both surfers and strong swimmers. And one day one of them swims into a cave, which, and then she kind of discovers this, like, this kind of like, uh, part of their like um like cliff area i don't know what you'd call it um that is haunted by all of these ghosts who want her to like save it from developers so it's kind of like a like anti-gentrification story but also like a paranormal story and what i really loved about it was that it's like a it's a paranormal story set in like a summer beach setting like you don't really get paranormal stories in that kind of setting, right? At least I like I haven't I haven't seen many of them. And um, so it was really refreshing and new and the art was just super cute and the story was just really, really adorable. Um and I loved the characters and I loved the art and it was just lovely. It was just lovely. I really, really enjoyed it. I read it over breakfast, I think was it last Sunday? I think last Sunday, yeah, and um, it was just a really nice way to start the day, <laughs> and it'd be a really nice way to end the day, or just like read in the afternoon, whatever you like. Um, I would really, really recommend it. It was lovely. And the last book um, I finished reading in March 2021 um, was the first volume of the Orphan Black comics. Um, I really liked the series Orphan Black, so I thought I'd give this a go. Didn't really add that much. It kind of like sets up for, for exploring some of the mysteries that the show doesn't fully develop. Um, and then because it's just like the first volume, it doesn't. <laughs> um, it, it's all kind of like set up for exploring later on. And I, as again, as with The Once a Future Queen, I think they only made one more volume of this. There hasn't been like another, like, you know, like it didn't really turn into a whole series. I would like to read the second volume to see if they did actually pursue some of the stuff they mentioned here. Um, but if they don't, then this book was just like a load of character book story. Like it might be, it probably like a nice thing for you to read if you really, really like Salt and Black. Um, and you want to see some of those characters again and get a little bit more backstory. Um, but it's like, you know, if you're like a casual Orphan Black viewer, you may feel like this is a waste of time. So probably a good one to check out from your library rather than invest your own money in. Um, so that was my, uh, I need to say February then. I can't keep track of what month it is. 
So that was my March 2021 wrap up. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you'd like to see more from me. If you would like to read my books but don't know where to start, check out my free ebooks, Ignite Your Passion for Reading, Fall in Love with Books. And if you're looking for a great read, even if I do say so myself, um, you can download a free copy of my um, novella, Unlucky in Lockdown, which is all about um, life at the start of the pandemic in the UK and flatmates and not getting on and learning to live with it all and all that tricky stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Thank you again for watching. You'll see me again soon. Bye.